Thank you for joining us today. I am Stephanie Fries, the 19th Amendment Coordinator at Women's Rights National Historical Park in Seneca Falls, New York. We are exploring Votes for Women, the Battle of the 19th Amendment, the most recent comic anthology released by Little, Bird, Little Red Bird Press. Um, this book celebrates the hard-won victories in the movement toward women's right to vote, acknowledges the harsh realities, and looks at the battle for gender equality still being waged. We have a great panel for you here today, so I'm going to give them the chance to introduce themselves. Okay, I will start. My name is Ali Schwed, and I'm the editor at Little Red Bird Press and was the editor on this anthology. Um, I am a cartoonist by trade and the editor of Little Red Bird by Night. I particularly focus on uh, comics journalism, political cartooning, history-based comics. Uh, I'm all, I've also been known to draw stupid, silly little cat comics as well. Um, but cartooning is my life, day and night. That's what I do. Uh, right now, I'm living in New Jersey, right down the Jersey Shore. And yeah, that's a little bit about me. And I'm Teresa Roberts Logan, and I do some historic comics when I can. I love doing that. I'm wor working on this, and then uh, another comic about uh, the kids at the border. I do a lot of silly stuff um, on Go Comics. I have Laughing Redhead Comics. I have a comic strip in development, but I'll talk about that some other day. And um, I just love telling stories. And I mostly do like a lot of ghost stories and creepy stuff and haunted things because I love that. But uh, I, I'm thrilled to be a part of this and I love historic comics and anything that I feel like educates us and just gets our voices out there better. It's great. So thanks. Know me. Oh, sorry. I thought I was second to last. Uh, hi, I'm Nomi uh, Kane, and I am a cartoonist, mostly an editorial cartoonist. I do political commentary and satire. Um, I do work for The Nib, sometimes The New Yorker, and previously Mad Magazine. By day, I am a toy designer at Super 7, uh, so I make action figures. And I live in Oakland, California with my giant dog. <laughs> Hi, I'm Grace. Uh, I'm a cartoonist all the time. Um, I do lots of historical, co I kind of do have like historical comics and anything. I'm working on a YA comic about like three little witches, which is really fun. Um, and... Yeah, I, I'm, a lot of my work is really inspired by the French, like, bon dessiné practice, like, strip comics and lots of, like, tight line work, bright colors. Um, I live in Brooklyn, New York with my fiancé and my little black cat. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lauren Sparks, and I live in Kentucky, and I work as a graphic designer during the day. And I make comics all the rest of the time, which is why my house is a mess. <laughs> um, I usually self-publish them, um, but I'm collaborating with a friend right now to illustrate a children's book. That's fun. And I have three cats, and here's one of them. <laughs> See how long she stays. Special cameo. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm so happy that you could all join us today to talk about this amazing project. Um, so, Ali, can you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, how this how this book came came into existence? What's you know, how did it start? What's the the process? What's it look like? Well, I the idea of doing some project related to the 19th Amendment came to me over two years ago. And I don't even remember if it was a podcast that I was listening to or I read an article that just mentioned, oh, the centennial of the 19th, like the ratification of the 19th Amendment is going to be in 2020. And it's just like something sparked in my mind that I'm like, ooh, make a note of that, do a comic. And I also work for, Nomi had mentioned the website The Nib, which is an amazing, amazing comics journalism website that does short pieces on anything from current events, politics to history. Um, and comics along those lines. So my first thought was, oh, do a short piece for the nib for the centennial anniversary. So I started reading more articles because probably like a lot of people, I didn't really learn about the suffrage movement in 
grade school or high school or really at all. Like you heard about Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony was definitely a name that popped up, but I didn't really know anything about it. So I started reading some articles and some books and going down these rabbit holes of learning about more people whose names I had never even heard of. So the more I started reading, I'm like, this can't be just like a 20 panel comic. This has to be a book. Like it has to be more than just a short little piece that I do, especially for the hundredth anniversary. That's huge. So at that time, right around that time, I had gotten my first book offer, which was also along the same lines. It's about the U.S. Constitution, but I just started work on that book. So I'm like, I, I can't make this book by myself. That's impossible. That would be ridiculous of me to think that I could do that. So I got the idea through my micro press, Little Red Bird that I would publish this anthology. So I put out a call for submissions that year. And then I also directly reached out to women that I admire their work, follow their work, have worked with them before. And we came up with this amazing group of over 30 women artists who joined us to make this comic. And basically some people came to me and pitched specific ideas. Some people just said, this is kind of what I'm into. If you have a topic that fits that, I'll, I'll take that comic. And some women were just like, whatever you want me to cover, give it to me, I'm game. And this is what we came up with. <laughs> That's incredible. So I should add that the way that our micro press works is that we were very small. That's why we call ourselves a micro press, not even small press. We consider ourselves a micro press. And we actually published through Kickstarter, which is a crowdfunding website where we put the project up on this platform, Kickstarter, and people will pledge and donate to our campaign to help us raise the funds to publish the book. So earlier this year, we launched it was right around Valentine's Day in February, we launched the campaign to raise 20,000 was our goal um, and we raised it. So by the end of March, the campaign ran for 30 days. We were able to reach our goal. So I knew that we were gonna have the funds that we could actually print the book. So now it's August, a few months later and our books just got published beginning of the month and now we're fulfilling the Kickstarter and mailing them out to all our backers and our artists and everyone who supported us. <laughs> That's awesome. And there's a there's an ebook available as well, right? Yes, there is. So if you are the digital savvy minded reader, we did have an ebook on our website as well as the book now. You could get it from our website, which is just levelredbird.press. And all of our other books are on there as well, but this is definitely our newest one and the one that we are super, super proud of right now. <laughs> and the, one of the things that I'm the most excited about this book, I think, is that we are donating a portion of the proceeds to a group called She Should Run, which helps support women who are considering a run for public office. So not only is this book telling the narrative and the stories of women who helped us get to where we are today, it's also supporting women who are going to take us even further in the future in the U.S. government. Awesome. Thank you, Allie. Okay, so for for everyone else, um, how how did how did you how did how did you get on this bandwagon? Um, you know what what motivated you to to want to to participate to want to to be part of this project? Um, well, the way I got involved was I have a dear friend here. I live in Pittsburgh, and I have a dear friend here, Theora Kavitka. And we get together and inspire each other and kind of check in with each other on comics and stuff. And she had told me about it. And so um, I contacted Allie and I was just thrilled to get, yes, there's her, uh, there's Theora's page. And um, yeah, hi, right, shout out to Theora. Uh, but it's, it, it's such a beautiful project and I was so excited and I had seen Little Red Bird Press's an Allie's work around and I was familiar. And so I was just so excited. So I contacted her and, and uh, as I recall, and, um, and just said, do you, what, what do you have left over that you need filled in? And um, she had these two uh, basic stories. Uh, and, and then one of them kind of evolved a little bit after I read a little more about Susan B. But uh, anyway, I, that's how I got involved. And I was super excited about it. I like that you're on a first name basis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Susan B. Yeah. Yeah, I was, uh, I think, Allie, we know each other because of the nibs. So I was on the 
email that you sent out looking to see who is interested. And I think I wrote back like five minutes after you sent it (laughs) (laughs) because it was just such a good idea. It's like, you know, it doing some research for a project is so much fun and doing a collaborative project is so much fun and doing something to celebrate women's right to vote is so much fun. It was just an obvious like, yeah, let's sign me up. Let's go. Yeah. I, um, I think I just finished working on another anthology, um, called wife faith and was like, you know, I would really want to like work on another anthology. Cause I felt like my work grew so fast working like with an editor and like getting input. So then I found on the Twitter find anthologies, I think I found Allie's like post or like the retweet of like, you should submit to this anthology. And I was like, you know what? Like I love historical comics. I like obviously am very passionate about the vote for women and had like a couple ideas so I pitched them and then Allie was like, what do you think about this idea? Um, doing a piece about the tableau and the march right before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. And I was like, heck yeah, like I'm super into that. Um, and then immediately started like thum- like frantically thumbnailing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I found out the about the anthology directly from Allie because I saw you at CXC, which is a comic book convention up in Columbus. Um, And we knew each other a little bit because we both went to SCAD at different times, but that's a thing, that's a connection. And you just handed me a flyer and you're like, oh yeah, I keep forgetting people to tell people about this. So here's this. And so I emailed back and I was really excited because I'd never done a history comic before, but I love history, so. That is cool. Yeah, so it just goes to show how far networking can really help. And I'm sure throughout the course of your research, you learned how big, um, how important networking was throughout the women's history movement. Um, So on research, um, you know, you've already said a lot of this is not stuff that you would learn in an average school history class. So, and it's a lot of it isn't common knowledge for most people. So how did you go about doing the, doing the research for your submissions? Well, I kind of, I knew, and especially with like these bigger anthology projects with really, really small publishers, we don't have the money to pay artists what they deserve, (laughs) but what a bigger publishing company like a Macmillan or an Abrams or a Random House can afford. So I knew that I could only ask so much of our artists. Like I didn't want them to have to do the exponential amount of work that it would take to put together a book like this. So I started by gathering as much research as I could to give each artist on their topic enough information to get started. So if they like didn't have the capacity, they weren't able to go to a library, they couldn't do any research, I wanted to give them enough that they could do their comic. So I started off by just reading every book that I could possibly read from just the overview ones like The Women's Hour by Elaine Weiss to more specific ones. Um, There was a book by Lillian Fetterman that's specifically about the history of lesbians in US history, like it follows American lesbians and how they affect U.S. history. And there was just one chapter in that book about the suffragists, but like I read that book all the way through and I just read and consumed as much as I could. I spent so many hours on the Library of Congress website, just like I was all over the place looking for things. And I tried to, again, gather at least an overview that I gave each artist when they got started to be like, at least you have like this starting ground and then take it from there where you would like to but that's that's kind of where i fit myself in uh for me i i was blown away with what ali had provided to us the link she sent and the things and i I mean so that's where most of my research to start came from I, i really was just amazed like visual research and historic research and because we were talking about yesterday about that's the thing you get nervous about is messing up the history like you don't want anything missing you know 
So I was so thrilled. But then I went to the library and I love old books and old things. And it's fun to go to the library because you do find old books that aren't just, you know, sitting there in a regular big box store or anything, you know, back when we could go places. Um, and so I went to the library and I found this book um, on Susan B. Anthony and I found a, just a stack of books and I kept reading excerpts. And the book that I um, got was Susan B. Anthony by Alma Lutz. And uh, I read sections of it and there were things that popped out at me and that's how I got into research. So it was library, but also the amazing amount of stuff Allie just put in front of us it was amazing. I also knew that not everybody is like the historical nerd, like my background, my undergrad degree was in American studies. So that's just like deep rooted in me that I love looking up that kind of stuff. And I know not everybody's like that. So I wanted to take that into consideration. Well, and the librarians at the Carnegie Library here, they were so excited. Like they, I had two librarians that were just around me pulling stuff out. And that was really fun too. I love that. I had this really bizarre experience where, so everything Allie provided was amazing. Uh, you were the easiest editor to work with of all time. Cause like, you were really? just this, like <laughs> stack of information, but I kind of cheated and picked a story that I knew pretty well already. Um, what I had to research is like what clothes people wore at that time and like what the Tennessee uh, house looked like. And I was at a friend's house and I was like, what did people wear in like just before the 1920s, like in the early part of the 1900s? And this friend of mine was like, hang on. And she goes into the other room and she comes back with like a bunch of Xerox printouts of people in these kind of clothes. I was like, why do you have these? And uh, she, oh, I'm researching this stuff here. You can take these. So it was like, I didn't have to do anything. It was amazing. Uh -huh. <laughs> in networking, that's having friends in the right places. My yeah. husband's in theater, so I grabbed this off our shelf. Okay. Like, like. <laughs> that's so awesome. I went to a like very research heavy school. I went to Hampshire College, and we do a lot of like long paper writing. Um, and I had all studio artists also have to have like kind of a minor concentration in like critical thinking. Um, so like I'm in an intimate relationship with JSTOR and Google <laughs> Scholar. Um, so I was like, oh my gosh, awesome. An excuse to go on Google Scholar. Um, so I did a lot of um, journals and um, like literary journals, a couple that like super stood out. There was a, one called Out of the Parlor and Into the Streets. Um, which was kind of about um, by Holly J. McCannon um, that was about like social forces and the transition from like, okay, here's a group of people um, who don't have power, who want power and how do they, like, how does that happen? Um, and then just a couple other journals that I feel like aren't as noteworthy. Um, Ali gave me an, the cookbook, like little one page comic that I did, Allie gave me an NPR um, article that was awesome that I like totally devoured. Um, and then while I was drawing, I <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then while I was drawing, because I like hate drawing in silence, um, I listened to Stuff You Missed in History class, <laughs> There's, which was like, I would scroll through and be like oh yes okay that one's about the suffrage movement or this one is about like victoria woodhall or like this one's about um susan b and like listen to those just to like kind of get in in that mindset and then everyone's gonna say it but the library of congress for like those image resources um i literally had on my desktop would be like podcast app and then all of these image references and I'd be like, what does a dress look like? Oh yes, thank you. <laughs> and then I draw it. So that's kind of my little bit. Um, for me, for the two comics I did, I, uh, the research processes for each were really different because one was about Frederick Douglass and of course he wrote a lot and there are a lot of photos of him because he was like this famous speaker who traveled all over the place. So Allie gave me 
like a short list. Uh, there was like research she started about his life and then I filled it in. He wrote like three autobiographies. So I read one of his autobiographies that was online for free because it's in the public domain. Um, so that was a really great help because there's lots of visual representations there that already exist. But for the second comic um, about the court case, Minor versus Happerset, that was a lot more difficult because Virginia Minor was a lot less well known as a person. And so um, I had to do just a lot of general research on the time period of when she was fighting for suffrage and when she was going through the court case. So I had like a Pinterest board that was just all dresses from like 1855 to 1872. It's like label them all in there and different hairstyles and all this stuff, all, all these old historical photos. Um, and Google books I found an excerpt about the history, um, one of the history of the suffrage movement. There was like excerpts from some of her letters to, Eliz I think to Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And I also, um, the St. Louis Historical Society, cause she lived in St. Louis, Missouri. And one of, I believe it's the main St. Louis um, city library, I think. Um, they had, a lot of resources specifically about her and her husband since they lived right there. So I was able to find a really great article about her on the St. Louis Historical Society site. That was one of the best um, resources for me. And they had references to a couple like newspaper clippings and stuff about the court case. And I also was able to send an email to the St. Louis um, library because I found out somewhere online it said that her husband's um, books on his work as a lawyer were still in that library. Well, so uh, that crap, I guess when he passed away. And since he was such a great ally to her in the court case, I tried to figure out more about him. And I emailed them. I'm like, can you just just send me scans of some of his notebooks, like just a few pages, so I can know what he was doing. So they just they took his old notebook and they slapped it on the scanner, and you can see this old old notebook paper and the cursive writing. Yeah. Of some of the stuff that he was working on during that time, it was amazing. <laughs> Libraries are great. Cool. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. So it sounds like everybody had had kind of their own their own processes on what works. But it sounds like Ali, you were diligent. <laughs> But for so a book can, like this, you you have to be because if you're gonna do it, you you have to do it right. Like we could have definitely done a fictionalized telling of the story and come up with just like a, a not a, like a fictional character and just told the story through that. But that wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do with this because there's so little historical books out there. If there were a ton of historical books, then yeah, it would have been fun to do something more fictionalized, and then we could have had fun with it in that regard. But there's just not, there's not that many books out there. So especially books that are very accessible. And that's, yeah. that was then what we wanted to do. So if we were going to do it, we had to do it. Right. But everybody stepped up amazingly. Like I never even heard that story, Lauren. I did not know that they photocopied his notebooks. That's amazing. So even now when I'm talking to the women who worked on it, they'll tell me these things of what they did and the links they went to. And it's just, it's inspiring. It's really inspiring. Not only that they went to these great links, but that there are people out there willing to be like, oh, you're doing this amazing project. Let me help you. Here's all this stuff. Because I don't think a lot of people know that that is out there and that if you just do it like a little bit of effort, you could find these amazing historical artifacts and books and what have you. Well, yeah. you know, also like I did another historical comic just about something in our family and it's connected to Ford's Theater. It's a building across from Ford's Theater in D.C. And I went to the National Park Service at Ford Theater. I went across the street and I said, do you know anything special about this building? It used to be the Logan Cafe in the 1860s and 80s. And I and the Park Service, you know, and I think a lot of people, you know, you instantly think of libraries, but not everybody will think to go to National Park Service and go, what information can you give me on this? <laughs> I mean, and I was thrilled because it opened the whole thing up and I could do the whole historic comic based on what Park Service told me about it. You know? That's awesome. 
Yeah. When I went through the book, I actually, I'll be frank. I tried to catch you. I tried to catch <laughs> something. Um, I looked at clothing styles. I looked at hairstyles. I looked at general plots. I have not read every single page of the book, but I've, I haven't been able to catch anything yet. (laughs) I don't know everything. I'm not saying everything is 100% accurate. I haven't read every word in the book yet, but from what I've read, I haven't been able to find anything yet. So kudos to all of you. Uh, Your, your research paid off. Um, you know, even button placement and collar shapes and hairstyles and things that, that I've seen incorrect elsewhere, you nailed it. (laughs) That's exciting. That's the artists doing their due diligence because they're, yeah, they just, they, they totally put their nose to the grindstone and busted out amazing, amazing work for the book. And again, that's something that if I was doing this book alone by page 30 of the 220 pages of this book, I would have just been like, I don't know anymore. But you you (laughs) gather together 31 other amazing people and this is what came out of it. So Awesome. Um, So I want to I want to take this opportunity to kind of. delve specifically into your each of your contributions to the book um, because you put so much work into it and each of your submissions are very different. Um, so Lauren, your submission on Frederick Douglass. At the end of it, you have a little a little artist note about how you were barely able to scratch the surface. Um, Frederick Douglass was larger than life. He was the most photographed individual during his lifetime. Um, and, and you summed him up into 12 little comic panels. How, (laughs) how did you do it? And how did you determine what to, what to include and, and not? Um, that was really, really difficult. Um, Allie will probably remember that my, we had just a Google Doc that was just research, 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 research. And then I just had to pull little points out because I had his whole life in like bullet points. Um, and I really tried and to pick. From there, one of the first like drafts that you sent me, like your caption boxes were like 90% of your comic page. And I'm like, Lauren, we need to see your heart. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that was a big problem going back and forth. They're like, okay, there's still too many words. There's still too many words. How can we get it shorter? It's all in points. Um, and I actually, I chose that uh, panel layout where it's just 12 equal panels across two pages because I couldn't tell a story and like have larger panels for more important things and smaller p- panels for less important things because there was just too much. So I tried to choose points in his life that echoed forward through his work. So him being born as a slave, but then being sent to work in a city for a family there and learning how to read in that location and then trying to escape slavery and going back to the plantation and teaching lots of other slaves how to read and just going through his life that way. Um, Here's another cat. Um, I liked how you drew him young, how you how you interpreted him at different ages. I really like that. That was, yeah, that was difficult because all the photos of him are when he was an adult. Let's see, I've got, here it is. So I found this sketch when I was going back through my um, process work where I was just trying to figure out how would he look as a little kid because we've only got his photos as an adult after he ran away and became famous. So that was... I guess that whole comic was just a process of elimination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I can only imagine. That was actually one of the ones that I think I I spent quite a bit of time with. And I was really like, hmm, I'm intrigued. (laughs) And I really appreciate that you kind of highlighted the significance of his wife um, as really being the, the linchpin to his freedom. Um, because that that really is how it worked out. Um, you know, if, if it weren't for Anna Douglas, it, it wouldn't have happened. Um, you know, yep, she yep. she really kind of created the created the man 
Um, so I really appreciated that you that you highlighted her um, and and her role because it's really significant. So I'm glad that that rose to the top of the bullet points. <laughs> yeah, one of my favorite pieces of research that I found was an essay that um, Douglas's daughter Rosetta Douglas wrote about their mother and everything she did to make his life work. Like he looked so hot in all those photos because she would ship him trunks of fresh clothes so that he would always look great whenever he gave a speech or was photographed. And she was taking care of their house and running a stop on the Underground Railroad the whole time he was gone and raising all their kids. She did everything. She's amazing. Anna Murray Douglas. Best. (laughs) Yeah, women keep the world running, but women don't yet run the world. (laughs) (laughs) Nice, Allie. Um, so Allie, um, and I had, I had emailed you specifically about, about your, your contribution to the book, um, in terms of your, your art. Um, and you take on two hugely important, but often controversial kind of parts of the women's history in, in your submission, um, where you talk about who writes history as well as what voting rights looked like after the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And you somehow managed to make that all fit together in one, in, you know, in one series of illustrations. Um, so can you tell us a little more about that and, and you know, why you felt like that was important to include? Yeah, well, when I was going through those rabbit holes that I mentioned earlier, two uh, pieces of literature that came to my attention. One was an article written by Tammy Brown, who's a professor of African American studies at Miami University. She wrote an article for the ACLU website that the headline of it, I don't remember exactly, but it was something along the lines of celebrate women's suffrage, but don't whitewash the racism of the movement. And that was like the headline of it. So I'm like, okay, I have to read this. And she basically goes into how a lot of the women who are part of this movement were, they were working towards getting white women to vote and they didn't necessarily work hard enough or even want African-American women or any other women of color to participate in that. So a big thing that gets discussed and it was actually a huge schism in the movement is when the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments gave like ended slavery and gave African men the right to vote it became kind of this like dividing point in the movement that women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony that we already mentioned, those are like the two big names most people knew, they didn't necessarily want to fight for black men or women to get the vote. And they thought that it would be too much movement to take on, which is kind of absurd because the suffrage movement was basically born out of abolition rights people women included fighting for abolition so it was definitely something when i read this article i'm like we have to acknowledge this like if this is the first time reading something like this and really truly thinking about it most other people probably aren't thinking about it either there's not enough information out there and then i was listening to a podcast Uh, And Gloria Steinem was getting interviewed and she didn't go into great detail, but she just mentioned very offhandedly this book, The Myth of Seneca Falls and how like, oh, anybody who cares about the suffrage movement has to read this book. So I was like, okay, that's me. I have to read this book now. And I did. And that book is basically all about how Seneca Falls, for as important as it is, very often gets marked as the beginning of the suffrage movement. But that wasn't necessarily the case. But what happened is that Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was a major player in the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, that she and Susan B. Anthony wrote this huge, huge volume, which was very, very important, called The History of Woman Suffrage, but they left out a lot. They basically picked and chose what was going to go in this massive volume, and it was literally called The History of Woman Suffrage, and they left out a lot. They didn't mention the huge role that Native American women played in it. And Native American, there was a huge indigenous population in the Seneca Falls area where this was all taking place, and that just doesn't get acknowledged. African American women who had huge roles with the the clubs that they formed and just all of the things they were doing with abolition don't really get mentioned in the book. So 
I knew that this needed to be incorporated. And I knew, as you said, Stephanie, it's a really controversial topic. And I didn't want to put that weight on any of the artists working on this book. So I'm like, I will do this comic. So if we get flack for it, I will be the one to take the flack. If anybody is like, how could you include this? How could you say this? And that's one of the points I put in my comic is that we want something like, oh, women's rights and women getting the vote to be this happy fairy tale story with a happy ending that's all like perfectly wrapped up in a bow. And it's not because what element of US history is, not any of it is that neatly just like happy ending kind of story. So I definitely wanted to acknowledge, and just the, I think it was like five pages, the comic that I did, it was still super, super short, only is the tip of the iceberg, as is this whole book. I wrote, I felt compelled to include an editor's note at the end of the book to just say like, this isn't even the full story. We could do volumes upon volumes and we still wouldn't incorporate the whole story. We could do an entire book just about the African-American women who contributed to the movement and what they still had to go through after 1920 passed and they still didn't have the vote and didn't get the vote until 1965 when the Civil Rights Act passed. So yes, I definitely felt that we needed to acknowledge it and get it in there. And a lot of the other comments in the book actually do too, like the the two women who worked on the comic about Susan B. Anthony did a very good job of balancing like, yes, she is this amazing figure that did so much for us, but she wasn't perfect either. Don't necessarily put her on a pedestal and not acknowledge all of the like maybe racist elements that she had in her life. So I definitely felt that that needed to be acknowledged. And I'm so glad that with the anniversary last week of the ratification, that you did hear so many articles and so many people posting about like acknowledge the women of color who contributed to the movement. So we're getting there. It's not quite there yet. I still don't think there's enough like Native American women definitely weren't mentioned as much, but it's getting there. At least people are recognizing it and that's that's a step in the right direction. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. I have to say that's because of what it talks about, it that's one of my favorite parts of the book personally, just because um, I tend to be of the mentality like, think about who you're talking about. These people were not angels, not to say that they didn't do incredible things and that they're not worthy of being, you know, memorialized as part of history. But you have to look at the whole picture. Um, you know, you have to look at at what they didn't say and what they didn't do just as much as what they did say and did do. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so, so thank you for that. I, I, I really appreciate that. Good, um, Grace. So I, I was caught off guard. Let's talk cookbooks. <laughs> <laughs> I had heard passing out in one conversation, one time about any connection between cookbooks and the suffrage movement totally was off my radar um <laughs> saw your comic so 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 talk to me here what what's the deal with cookbooks um uh, well i love cooking so <laughs> when ali was like hey i read this npr article like re like would you want to do something about this um and i was like oh yeah sure I'll, like i'll do that yeah it's fine um and read it and then was even more fascinated because it's so the connection seems like when you actually think about it so obvious um so like cooking itself is such a reflection of the world we live in right now and you can see that like in depression era cooking like depression cakes that didn't involve um like flour or not flour sorry um like eggs or milk so that you could actually like eat without like spending your resources um, or like World War II food that really removes a lot of the stuff that would have been rationed. Um, so I read a lot of cookbook research that wasn't directly related to the suffrage movement, but had to do with the broader like history of just food and like what food means. Um, and then started like read this article and was like, oh, wait a minute, like how do how does a population that has very little capital and very little mobility make money that is theirs? Uh, and like, you can even think about it in the context of like a high school prom, right? High schoolers are broke, they don't have any money. So what do they do? They have bake sale. Um, and 
it allows them to utilize like their own income for like their goal. And in the case of the comic that I talk about, I actually illustrate the front cover of the um, cookbook that they, one of the cookbooks that was made um, and was distributed was, it was very, and the cookbook recipes that were in the book were very simple, like basic home cooking that any, like that not only um, women who probably weren't cooking that much, like women of like very high privilege in society, but also like the people who were doing the cooking for those women could accomplish, like could accomplish. Um, so really simple recipes and women could justify going around being like, oh, I'm just selling this cookbook to some of my girlfriends to make some money. And it wasn't, cooking seems very inoffensive to a lot of people. Um, so no one was going to get on these women for, for like exchanging recipes. Um, and no husband was going to be like, well, you can't buy that cookbook, honey, because it's a cookbook. They're like, oh, no. Like, I want my wife to buy the cookbook because I want her to cook good food. Um, so it's this really lovely and innocuous way of um, making cash for um, the movement. And I try to, like, play out, like, I think the language of that particular comic uses a lot of um, cooking puns. So I, like, once I got that, like, high school bake sale analogy in my head, I was like, oh, duh. Like, or car washes, right? Like <laughs> another kind of example. So it was really fun to work on that and the idea of um, just exchanging little like paperback copies to each other to make money to make money for something that they had no resources. They had no resources. Um, so every time they sold a cookbook, it was so crucial. Um, in making money for the movement when a lot of their wealthier husbands might not have said like, honey, I don't want you to be involved in this, but like, they're not going to offer their capital. Um, so it was a really kind of interesting way to get around that roadblock. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Grace. Yeah. Um, Lauren. So Virginia Minor. Um, so from the state of Missouri, um, you know, took legal action to try to modify the Missouri state constitution, was escalated up to the Supreme Court in Minor v. Haberset. Um, and, and ultimately, she wasn't successful. Um, so people who are scholars of women his women's history know all about it, but it's not something that um, is is often part of the, la the larger conversation. So can you talk a little bit about Minor V. Happerset and um, you know, why why is it here? Um, you know, she she wasn't successful. So how did this contribute to the larger movement? Well, I am definitely not a scholar <laughs> of women's history, but as far as I can understand from my research, um, before her court case was lost in 1872, I believe. Um, there were kind of two simultaneous um, groups trying to, within the women's suffrage movement, there were two groups trying to win the right to vote. And one group was trying to use existing laws to say, we should be able to vote already and we're gonna use it, we're gonna use these existing laws to prove it. And the other group thought there needed to be new laws written or constitutional and amendment written to say that women had the right to vote. So um, they weren't like really fighting about it, but that was just two different methods people were using to try and win the right to vote at all. And after Virginia Minor, or rather her husband, sued the state of Missouri on her behalf, um, and they lost the case in Missouri and took it all the way to the United States Supreme Court and lost again because because they were trying to use existing laws that said these are rights of citizens 
And they were kind of extrapolating and saying, okay, well, women are citizens, therefore women should be able to vote. Once they lost that case, because it wasn't explicitly stated in the law, basically the movement understood, okay, yeah, we need to write something new. Great. Thank you, Lauren. And it's true that that while she did lose her case, it did create a dramatic shift in the look of the suffrage movement because it kind of made that that group of people that were like, current laws apply to us, you're just interpreting it wrong to say, okay, wait a minute, we're not going to win our way. We need to find a new tech to get where we want to go. Yep. Um, so it, 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 yeah, it definitely did play a big role. We still see that like the ERA today. That, I was about to say. That like we need the ERA and people who say we don't, and that's not even getting into like Phyllis Schlafly territory, but just like people who are like, oh no, we don't need it, we're fine. That's yeah. not the case. And this is the perfect example of it and how that down the line, it did change successfully to a certain extent, but that it did wake people up to be like, oh no, wait, we need to, <laughs> to get that proper wording in there. Yeah, sometimes the goal is just to shift the conversation. Yeah. Um, so, Teresa, um, in your submission at the top, in lovely script, by the way, um, is a Susan B. Anthony quote that I had never heard before, and it caught my attention right away. And it's, never in all my hard experiences have I been under such fire. The clouds are so heavy over me. I never before was so cut down. Um, so it, it's it's sad. <laughs> what what about this quote spoke to you? Well, when we were talking about the story and doing something about Susan B. Anthony and Aaron Sargent, who took it to the floor, um, I had gone and researched a whole lot of things with the backgrounds, you know, and the just big. DC kind of stuff. And I was looking through this book um, and it's the one I mentioned before and I think it came out in 1959 and it's just called Susan B. Anthony. It's about Alma Lutz. And I was flipping through and what jumped out at me on one of the pages was Denver because I lived in Denver for 20 years. So I was like, oh, Colorado, a Colorado connection. So I started reading this and it was a story about how she had been out in California and doing all the suffrage activity and just, you know, getting booed and jeered and just, you know, your nightmare of public appearances, you know, and I just felt for her because I mean, I've done stand up comedy for years and I've done outdoor festivals and I don't do them anymore. It's like it's a nightmare to stand outside and have a non sympathetic crowd. And I really it just made my heart go, oh, my God. So what happened was she was just in despair and she wrote this in her, I don't know, journal, diary, whatever she was keeping. And then she was taking a train trip across the West. And she meets this family and it's the sergeants and it's him and his wife and kids and they share a picnic with her and they start talking and they find they have politi similar political leanings as far as women go. And long story short, that was her key to get it in. You know, um, they became friends. And so then I, I want, we're doing this in one page and I just wanted to, I thought this is just such a cool moment from her just having despair and um you know as cartoonists and freelancers i feel like we all go through that you know where you're like whoa when is the tide gonna turn and it just there were just a lot of levels on which it just spoke to me like just i thought oh this sounds like my journal you know so i don't mean it's not all about me ladies and gentlemen but i i really was thinking i love that moment where you are just in despair and you're actually being jeered and people are ridiculing you and when we see this today when anybody wants to say the simplest thing to assert their rights people mm -hmm. have a problem with it always and you're just kind of like why why do people have a problem with people having rights you know basic rights so she was in despair and was taking this road trip well on a train uh, through the west and met this family and it just it turned a tide for her and um, I don't know her whole history. I don't know her whole story, but I do think that it, it, when you make this much of a difference in history, there are a lot of moments, a lot of tide turning moments 
Uh, you might not always notice them, you know, but I thought this was one and I just wanted to capture that. So, so bad diary day is what it was. <laughs> <laughs> but that's where I got the quote. Uh, and, and what caught my eye was Denver, Colorado. And then she went to California. I started reading about Colorado and then the West. So it was almost, it was almost random that you found it. That's kind of cool. <laughs> yes, because there was so much on her. And as I said, Allie provided us with so much material, fantastic material. And I mean, just Allie's comic alone, I was looking at the list of names at the end of people I've never heard of. Mm -hmm. And that breaks my heart. And I do want to see their stories and I do want to read their stories. So, um, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so Grace, you briefly mentioned it earlier. So, so let's dig in a little bit. Uh -huh. Um, and, and juxtapose was the first word that, that came to mind when I was looking at your submission, um, about the tableau in front of the treasury building. Um, and then you kind of follow that up. You, you contrast it with the violence of the parade um, and what the suffragists experienced um, during the 1913 parade the day before Woodrow, Pre President Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. Um, so you can, can you tell me a little bit about how that came together, how you've got like the, the beauty and the ugly and you smashed it together in a way that just made so much sense that I had never really thought about it like that. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think subconsciously I was thinking about um, that, like natural, the natural just, juxtaposition, partially because there had just been a lot, obviously now I'll totally, but you think of political marches even today, how, just how many people end up, like good people end up coming away in like handcuffs or getting spat in the face of by people who just like disagree or even in, in the case of the 1913 parade, police officers actively arresting these women who for the most part, I, especially, I think especially in the American movement, um, were not violent and I, women of color were absolutely like targeted by officers just for like existing in that space which was already a space that was really difficult for them to be in as like a woman of color in a movement that was like we talked about earlier, like really didn't know how to, some people were very anti people of color, it just in movement in general. Some people just kind of didn't have an opinion and didn't really talk or just like chose not to talk about it. Um, so I wanted that to kind of be, I want this like beautiful parade and it's like, oh, look how lovely, look how charming. And then like to kind of shatter this, like the facade of that. Um, because like we were talking about earlier, there is kind of this idea like, oh, let's put a pretty bow on it. Let's like make it so um, like there's this beautiful parade and then the end women get the vote and yay. Um, and that wasn't the case at all. I mean, this was the 1913 parade so long, I mean, significant amount of time before the vote is even brought up. This was just kind of their, a big attempt at kind of raising awareness. Um, and I think like part of the reason why I was so attracted to it was in the primary sources that I was using, like Inez Milhound's, um, a few notebooks of hers, and then um, the a couple of the other organizers like there's this heavy emphasis and I have a page where it's like a ribbon banner that says like charity and some other virtues um, was just like making them seem human, which is so sad to me, like just so upsetting that like the first thought is just to make an, this audience of men, which the photos are incredible to look at because it's just these like women in these, basically like togas and like little tiaras um, and other women like, yeah, there we go. That's the page. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> um, and like really trying to channel like um, Greco Roman statues and just be like, look, we are virtuous. Like we do deserve this and it shouldn't be about deserving. That's not what the conversation is. <laughs> um, and like 
later um, in the process, Allie brought up, was like, oh, I want to incorporate red into the color palette. And I had been really struggling because I was like, I don't know how to bring red into like my pages. Um, and then I had this like diagonal scene where like the kind of conflict comes to a head, right? The tableau happens. There's this like lovely performance. People are talked are saying how in awe they are of the performance, how like moving it is. And yet at the end of this performance that supposedly everyone is on by supposedly moves everyone um, kind of hell breaks loose. And, and like, yeah, exactly. Everyone's like, Oh, by Jove, that's so majestic there. And <laughs> then like, you're going to turn around and spit in these women's faces and, and arrest them. So I was like, Oh, I'll add a red background. And then, it was like, oh, red for only these. And I was like, oh, but I still like, just even thinking about that color played a big role in drawing that page. Um, and then that led really easily into the today's protests. And I like making a reference to the civil rights um, movements and just how much like tableaus, performances, marches, protests in general, gatherings at spaces, holding hands, um, is kind of like the embodiment of any kind of social social justice movement. Um, I, I like was just kind of how I wanted to come to an end to like also represent the fact that like, look, this isn't over just because like a couple people with power were able to rise above doesn't mean that there are other there aren't other people who still crucially need the vote. Um, or representate not so much the vote, but just the representation in space. So I had a lot of fun, like trying to crack the open that that egg. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a it was a lot of fun to to look at. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I want I like really wanted to. Uh, I enjoyed drawing just the the togas. There were some really great photos that I didn't get to incorporate of like little girls who looked like some like someone was like yeah we're gonna have a greek party and then like parents had like just been like yeah here we'll put this on you it's a sheet you look great <laughs> i like really wanted to do that and i was like there's really no space huh to have just like little random children because <laughs> kids were a really big part of the performance to kind of evoke that like feel bad like we deserve it look how innocent we are so I was like, man, I should draw more kids. <laughs> yeah, I got I got a couple there. Yeah. <laughs> but really wanted more. <laughs> uh, uh, kids. Kids are a nice transition to you, Nomi. Let's talk about the good boy. <laughs> Before Nomi starts, I just need to totally shout her out because the red color that Grace mentioned, that was all... Nomi's choosing. So I came up with the idea that like, okay, I want there to be a unified color palette and purple and yellow are the colors of the US suffrage movement. And then Nomi will explain it a little bit more, but we needed a red and she was just like, I got a Pantone palette right next to me. I got you, we got this. And she picked like the most beautiful red. <laughs> Nomi, I got so many compliments from people both in the anthology and outside of the anthology that was like, oh, that red, it's so beautiful. So thank you know, for bringing that into our comic. <laughs> See, this is what happens when you design action figures all day and you have a pants <laughs> on right next to you. Like, hey, this goes. yeah, this is good. <laughs> and the red rose. So Nomi, when I looked at yours, the red rose, uh, like with the purple background, stood out so prominently to me. Um, so, so tell us a little bit about, about young Harry Byrne. Um, so Tennessee, um, the, you know, the, the 36th state to, to ratify the 19th amendment, um, you know, making it universal national law, um, you know, Harry Byrne letter from his mom, um, you know, he, he was the tipping point. I mean, he walked into the room wearing the red rose, the symbol of the anti-suffragists, and then voted yay and and ultimately resulted directly in Tennessee ratifying the 19th Amendment and half of the, the national population finally getting access to the votes. Um, you know, 
a lot of people were were angry. He received hate mail. Um, so so, what are we to what are we to take from this? What are we to to learn from Harry Byrne and and his mom? So I love this story, and I picked this story because I think it's really applicable to where we are in our society right now. It's a story about allyship and it's a story about civic participation and it's a story about appealing to someone's humanity which we see so little of right now um and i think it's just really fascinating and empowering to to realize that one person's decision um, on a dime can make a huge difference to lots of people and it and it sort of echoes, you know, what we're seeing right now in the Black Lives Matter movement of like it addresses the thing of that when one group has power and another does not, the shift doesn't happen until the group with power allows that access to the group without it. Um, and that's why it matters for allies to get out there and be part of it, right? I mean, it's it's kind of the same thing, like gay marriage wasn't allowed until straight people were like, you, no, no, we should do that. We should stand up for our friends and our family. Like, so I think, I, I think it's just a great example in history of how allyship is actually key to getting people the basic human rights that they deserve. Um, and also, I just love the story of like, uh, a guy who who made a massive decision for the entire country because his mom told him to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually, I, I have a, a temporary exhibit at at the park right now um, that's specifically about the the War of the Roses, the Red versus Yellow in in Tennessee, um, and it talks about you know the significance of this one vote and and you know. Just, just a boy listening to his mom, um, and and what a massive impact that that had, um, you know, across the entire country, um, you know, especially in in recent elections, you hear, you know, well, my vote doesn't matter. You want to bet? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Regardless of who it's cast for, it matters. I think that's the big takeaway here is that mm-hmm. if it's kind of a uh, you know, it's an illustration of how democracy should function. I think a big part of why our democracy currently is so dysfunctional is because people are so disillusioned and disenfranchised that the less people who participate, the less well a democracy functions. And so I think it's important to tell stories in which one voice does make a difference. Uh, you know, I live in California, which is the biggest, bluest state of them all. And it's really easy here to feel like it doesn't matter if I go vote or not. We're going to, you know, we're going to go blue and all the right decisions are going to get made. But that may be true in a national election, but in your own, you know, city council and mayoral elections and, you know, district representatives, it's it's really important that you do that because if you want there to be a a greater diversity of candidates on a national stage, you have to start with them on a local stage. So even in a big blue state, your vote still matters. It's just, sorry, I got a little off track. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's a solid tangent though. Pretty important. (laughs) Yeah, that's not off track at all. (laughs) I mean, I think that's part of the point of this book in many ways, right? Is that how did, how did women, and, and this is not to overshadow the, racism and the amount of time it took for and and still honestly like people of color do not have full voting rights in this country if we're honest about it like there's a constant effort towards voter suppression and a constant effort towards disenfranchisement and like uh and that's still happening especially around people of color like are the powers that be because we continue to allow white men to be in charge of anything it's like there's there's still this massive effort to keep people away from voting um, but I think that makes this even a more hopeful document of this history that like those forces can can be pushed. And with Harry Byrne in particular, um, you know, find find that young person with a little bit of power and convince them. 
write letters to your family. Yes. Very yes. important. <laughs> Listen I, to your mom. I, I love that. Like, it seems like superficially that it's like, oh, well, it's a man who gave women the vote. But really, no, it was his mom. It was yes. his mom who really was. <laughs> and that was why I chose to draw this uh, with her as the storyteller, um, because in many ways, his vote was her vote. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think I, I think that was like a fun little framing device for me. And it let me draw my dog at the very end. <laughs> <laughs> so so no, we kind of started to, to, to get into it here. Um, so let's kind of broaden it up a little bit. Um, so after researching the history of women, um, you know, finally achieving the right to vote and, and your piece in this book, um, you know, kind of for everyone, how has this project affected the way that you think about, um, you know, about voting today and, and the politics that we're facing today? Like, how has how has this project civically changed you? Well, I'll definitely something that I kept in mind throughout the entirety of this book. Well, two things that I, I'll kind of start us off with. Well, one is that I wanted to make sure the book was brought into the 21st century, that it didn't just end in 1920. Because not only that was not the end of the story, but we still have some of the benefits, including women still have the right to vote, but like the League of Women Voters is still around today and there's a lot that did carry over. But as we were all saying, there's still things that haven't been solved. Like Native Americans weren't recognized as citizens until a couple of years after with the Indian Citizenship Act. Mm -hmm. African-American women were given like full voting rights and still aren't today, as Nomi said, but really with the Civil Rights Act. And I really wanted to make a point of bringing it to where we are today to see like these women made huge, huge strides for us, but we still have a long way to go. And if we don't continue to make those strides, like we're letting those women down, all that work they did for us, we need to keep carrying that torch and still make those huge strides. Um, so that's why when we were trying to figure out, I knew that I wanted to donate a portion of the profits to some organization and had all the women artists vote. We all voted. I put together like a couple different organizations and the like democratically, we all chose She Should Run, which again is an organization that supports women running for public office. So I think that's huge that it's like we are helping support that. But on that same token, like the flip side of that is we still need organizations like She Should Run. There's no men's organizations that are like trying to get men active in the like in political office because we don't need that. But we need She Should Run, Emily's List, like those kind of groups we still need right now because we haven't made those great strides. Right. I mean, since Jeanette Rankin was the first woman to become a member of Congress in 1917, only like a little over 350 women have served in Congress. And that was since 1917. And if you do the math of like, well, there's 100 senators, there's 435 members of the House of Representatives, 359 women since 1917, like that math doesn't add up. That does not add up. So we still have a long, long, long way to go. Great strides, but we are not there yet. There is a massive organization uh, encouraging men to run for office. It's called the United States of America. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that I have, I think that I used to think that there were rights th that existed that really don't. I really think that we thought voter suppression wasn't where it is. And I'm glad it's coming to light, but I can't believe it's 2020 and it's still just going on right in front of us. And I always hope when I read stuff like this and when I look at the news every day, I always hope that can't we, I thought that our agreement in general is a high goal that we have not nearly reached enough, but that people have a voice and that we work for people to have a voice. And to see how aggressively voices are suppressed, to see how system, systematically and aggressively and right in front of us, voices are being suppressed, 
Um, it, it's, it's, it, I think projects like this make you pay attention, pay attention to the details. Like Nomi was saying about the one, the one person, the one thing that, you know, can make the diff. I mean, and, and the story I was telling about the train trip, you meet that person, you do a thing together. It changes history. And I think it just emphasizes over and over how important every single voice is. Every voice, you know, I want us just as citizens of this country to be able to welcome new citizens, new people, people um, who are escaping other places which don't even pretend to have the ideals we have. And, and I feel like we just have so much more work to do to come close to implementing the ideals that we talk about all the time in the Constitution and I feel like information, you know, facts, getting the facts out there and information and looking at, you know, unveil, un, un, unveiling our ignorance. You know, there's a lot of stuff that I've just read in y'all's stories that I didn't know about, you know, and, and um, I'm always open to that, but I also feel like we need to take lessons from it. We don't need to just be going, what a cool story. You know, we need to go, God, what, what can I take from this? This, this tiny thing, this person that made the point to go vote, this person that made a point to share a picnic with somebody on a train, um, just how important the voices are and how aggressive the oppression is and suppression of voices. And how can I, how can I be an ally? How can I always be an ally to a voice that's being suppressed or oppressed? I mean, I think one of the things about the book is that it fills you with a sense of responsibility, right? There's like a, there's a level of like, wow, here's all these stories I maybe didn't know all the details of or hadn't heard before. But at the, at the end of it, it's just a feeling of there's still work to be done and it's on us to do it. And the beauty of this being such a collaborative, expansive project is even in just reading it, you're like, well, at least these 31 other people are on board. That helps. Like, <laughs> and it's a good, I think it fills you with like a little bit of hopefulness. It does. It does. Yeah. I, I think um, while I was working on the project, I was also teaching high school. And I like in that process of like working on this book that was research heavy, teaching teens specifically, um, <laughs> really got me reflecting on my own high school experience. And we've all brought it up on like how little we didn't know and how much of a tragedy that is. Like not, not one of us was like, gee, I was so glad that I never learned, you know? <laughs> um, and also to emphasize like that, you know, the tome that Susan B. Anthony wrote that actively excluded women of color and the indigenous people who were writing and how like we acted as ambassadors to a certain extent of, of a bunch of different stories. And it is still our responsibility just in our community to be ambassadors of other people's voices and, and allies of those voices. Um, and one of my favorite authors, Lydia Yuknovich, talks about um, feminine rage, not as related to like gender identity, but this like feminine rage is this abstract sense of being and being like angry about disenfranchisement of, of people. And I think I felt that a lot in the book while writing the book, um, just because of the research that you have to come across when you write books about um, oppression. But I also felt that sense of responsibility and eagerness to do things like this, right? To talk to people, to hopefully talk to parents and their kids about this, you know, to get the opportunity to go to um, and host even virtual events. Um, something that I do a lot is like talk with public libraries and like go to public libraries and like educate specifically kids who are going to public libraries because they don't have access to um, comics education at their school or whatever. So I think like that's been something that really inspired me while working on it, is just this idea that 
through comics, through something that I love, I can help educate more people and hopefully get those people who should be telling their stories to write more and to tell their stories. If I can turn to a kid who was like, oh, I don't know about art. Like, I'm not into this. And then they read that and they're like, oh, wait, I have a story about how my family came to the U.S. and like how my dad got to vote for the first time. That's awesome. He like they should tell their story. That's great. And that's why I think I was excited to do the project. Yeah. Grace, I didn't know you were a high school teacher. Yes. <laughs> I bless you so much. I, felt, I, I also felt a ton of pressure. Like I have to get this right because this actually happened. This is not a fantasy comic. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm often drawing. Like, I, I want to get this right because I want to do justice to the people that I'm researching because they're amazing. Um, and sometimes we really don't have the whole story and we, like, we'll just have a general feeling in our head, but no data to back it up. Like what you were saying earlier, Teresa, like, well, we think, yes, everyone is equal in the United States. Everyone, yes, it's great. But, and yet we can't pass the equal equality em amendment to the Constitution. It's been what since 1970 i don't remember the year i haven't read that part of the book yet <laughs> <laughs> but i know it's been many many decades and yet we cannot get the equal rights amendment passed mid 1920s yeah i was gonna say it's even earlier most people will think it was like the 70s with gloria Steinem and like yeah. the, that whole movement but yeah it was actually like alice paul and way 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 before that oh, oh my god yep also in Seneca Falls, the first Presbyterian church right up the street from the park is where she came and first first read the, the Equal Rights Amendment. And I don't remember the exact year, but early to mid-1920s. Yeah. Wow. So it's like crazy, right? That 100 years later, we're still talking about whether or not we need that. That's how, different, how different would it be right now if we were celebrating both women's right to vote and women's <laughs> equality? <laughs> I feel like we don't need that is always such a weird argument for getting rid of laws or not passing them right like getting rid of the voting rights act because like oh we don't need that it's like if I went on a road trip and I was like oh I have this bag of snacks should I bring it and someone's like no nah, we're not gonna need it it's like well we might like why not just I'm put like it in the car like, <laughs> like we already bought the snacks so yeah. bring Next. Like, awesome. All we have to do is take them from the house to the car. Like what, yeah. what is going to be hurt by me putting these snacks in the car? Like, I just, I don't understand the, we don't need it anymore attitude of why we're not passing it. Especially yeah. if that's yeah. such a self thing. Like that's like, oh, that's cause you don't need it. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, and then that circles back to who are the people in power who yes. need to help the people who aren't in power, right? It, it all comes back yep. to that. Well, and there's so many freaky, weird little laws that you just now and then you'll see these little news bits where it's like, uh, they, you know, this state just got rid of the law that says you can't paint your door purple. And you're <laughs> like, was that, you're kidding. Like, you can't believe it was still. <laughs> and I feel like, because we're not all lawyers, I mean, we need to make whatever incremental steps we can to protect all there's all these little weird laws and glitches and loopholes out there not to sound paranoid because i am encouraged by the book because i feel like what it shows is a goal makes a difference one foot in front of the other towards a goal makes a difference you know but but yeah there's so many weird laws that it's just like it's just, I mean, they're literally protection laws, right? And it's like, I guess the better metaphor is like, my house caught on fire. I had a fire extinguisher. I put it out. My house is no longer on fire. Should I now throw away my fire extinguisher? Because. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. It just doesn't. Yeah. We don't need those protections anymore. Throw them out. Like, what is it taking up valuable space somewhere? Like, that's yeah. limited? It's just a, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm looking at the clock and there's one one kind of part of the conversation that I want to make sure that we have time to get into. So you are all artists, you are all women. Um, and and I, I'd like to explore a little bit um, what that looks like in in your industry, in your in the in the comic field. Um, you know, what kind of 
what kind of challenges or advantages, if there are any, do you do you all find um, as you seek to um, you know to to create, to promote, to disseminate, to to get your work out there, whether it's political or fantasy? It, what what does that look like as women in a field that is you know from the outside looking in largely male dominated? Yeah, I mean, I think again, comics is just like a microcosm of like the bigger picture of like, we live in a world where only 7% of the Fortune 500 CEOs are women, right? 7%, that's like a scary number. And like comics is just like, it's all of, all industries are a reflection of like that bigger picture and that problem, right? So we need more women editors. We need more women who are owning publishing companies and things like that. But I think something for me personally that I always think about and I do a lot of comics that are directly either journalistically or politically or historically telling the story like Votes for Women is just like a historical retelling of the narrative. But I think there also just need to be a lot more like fictional stories out there that just happen to have a female protagonist. And it's not the turning point of the story that it's like, oh, here's a book with a female protagonist, but more so here's a really amazingly awesome book. And it just so happens the protagonist is female. Like I think it needs to become this normalizing thing. And that goes for characters of color, that goes to LGBTQIA characters that like, I think right now we're still at the point where it's like, oh, let's talk about what it's like to be a woman in comics instead of like, oh, you're a person who works in comics, who happens to be a woman, but you work in comics, let's just talk about comics kind of thing. Like personally that I would like to have that be the goal, right? That it just happens to be that like, we are all women who happen to be in comics, but we are just awesome cartoonists, number one. <laughs> I think um, one of the coolest things that happened recently on Twitter, because I'm, I'm, so I'm very plugged into like the publishing kids lit, because I worked as like at a studio assistant for uh, Tony and Angela D. Terlizzi, amazing people. My mentors, they're the best. So I have to shout them out. Um, but so I was super plugged into the like young adult and there was a recent movement on Twitter where people started posting like how much they were making for their advances. Um, and it became almost immediate cl immediately clear that like people of color and women like were disadvantaged not, I mean, you're getting the book published, right? Which is what you want to happen. And that's amazing. But the capital that you now command is less than perhaps it might be if um, you were a man, which is horrible. It was just like unfortunate. Um, on the flip side, I also find that sometimes I get this false sense of security because I surround myself, my my community that I immediately surround myself, right? And we can even see in this panel, like these are all amazing creators. And like all of you, I, like we're having this great conversation, we're all vibing. And, um, you know, the people I hang out with are all super like in touch and like most of them are not cis men. And then I'll go into like a comic book store and I have this vivid memory. I go into the comic book store. There's a dude at the counter. I'm like, just with my friends, totally fine. And he, get, he goes up to me and says, do you dance burlesque? And it's like, that is just like, where did that come from? Yeah. Like, why can't I just be like, like, oh, I'm actually a cartoonist. Like, I make what you sell. <laughs> Don't mind me. Uh, and so I think it's just, like my community is so amazing and the people who like the people I follow on Instagram and the people who I go to TCAF with or all my comic shows, they're awesome. I love them. Um, but I think expanding to the broader community are the audiences that our books are for and people's books are for need to start thinking about like, Oh, let's have like, what if, the character of this book um, is someone with a disability who is also a woman. Uh, oh, what if this book is a person of color with a disability who's also, you know, like just ways to incorporate like ourselves and 
people who aren't ourselves into our stories and like bring that empathy to the world. <laughs> yeah, I think it's interesting because it, in that way, the internet as, as with all things can sometimes be a blessing and a curse, right? There's all this like really incredible like online community uplifting thing that happens between uh, women on the internet who are making art but then there is also a lot of harassment uh, from men who don't want you there. And it's just a really interesting, like, it's a very double-edged sword. Like, one, one day you feel like, this is so great, everything is so supportive and so beautiful. And, like, the next day someone, like, DMs me a video of a beheading because they didn't like my political opinion. And it's just like, okay, uh, you know, it, it's up and down. <laughs> yeah, I had, and this was a while ago, I had done a comic about, you know, complaining about the, the Muslim ban, and some dude just, like, sent me, no warning, just, like, a video of a beheading, and he was like, so this is what you want for everyone in America, and I was like, wow, I, that is offensive, <laughs> like, that, that was really crossing a boundary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. So, so it can uplift you and it can also crush your soul some days. Do you find, Nomi, that, and, and Ali and, I mean, I don't do political comics, so, like, I don't, I definitely do journalism, but not as much political. Do you find that in those spaces where I feel like journalism is definitely currently more male-coded that you, you get bothered more because of that? Yeah. I mean, people don't... Well, I, you know, people who are anti-women's rights and anti-feminist and anti-progress um, really don't like women having an opinion. <laughs> yeah, and definitely the ones that I've gotten like the nastiest comments on were political pieces that were specifically about women's rights. Like I've done journalistic comics that are just more generalized or like the history of something. But when it's specifically like, I remember one of the worst ones I got was I did a piece about abortion and I got like the next oh, yeah. like comments about that because that is a woman writing about a specifically woman's issue, which is not just a woman's issue, but it's like most people will look at it and it's like, yeah, no, it's these women complaining about having babies, uh, whatever. So that's what I definitely in my personal experience is the more female oriented my comics are, the harsher the comments are going to be. I would I would echo that completely. The gnarliest comments I have ever gotten were a piece I did for the nib, like right after kind of the the explosion of the Me Too movement about all all the casual sexual assaults that like every woman on earth has experienced in her lifetime. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the comments were out of control, just out of control. And it's like all men telling you either that like, no, you're wrong, that's not assault or harassment was a big one. Like, by the way, let me tell you what your experience was because I know all about this. And and then also just the like, well, this woman must be doing something totally wrong if this many people have harassed or assaulted her. I'm like, no, literally everybody. Like man <laughs> <laughs> slaying. That's yeah. Maggie Ram. That's from Maggie's comic. So great. <laughs> yeah. I was I'm thinking gonna, it, but I wasn't going to say it. <laughs> comics, yeah. comics gay exists. That was a thing several years ago. Yeah. yeah. And I actually, if you I, could explain a little bit about comics gay, just in case people who are watching don't know what it is. Yeah, I have no yeah. idea. So, like, I'm lucky because I just kind of keep to myself and I make little mini comics and I sell them at conventions in Ohio and Kentucky at the end. Um, but comics gay was basically men who claim that they love comics, but really it's they love comics as they were when they were only published by men and created by men and illustrated by men, going after female writers of comics, female journalists who were reviewing comics, female artists, and harassing them online en masse. Like they would coordinate and gang up on one person and just harass them and they doxed several people, I believe, and they had to like move and go somewhere else because they were afraid for their life. Their information, their personal information was out on the internet. And some of them would call the police and be like, well, what? what are we supposed to go arrest Twitter? 
it's it's a combination of being a woman, being harassed for being a woman, and then also not being taken seriously for the threats that you're receiving because you are a woman, both because you are, are a woman. And that's kind of how, that's the kind of the impression I got, like doing research on that, though I wasn't involved in it at all since I'm nobody. Is that, does that uh, yes. seem like a good sum up, Allie? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And it's something that pops up in a lot of industries, like video games have the same thing. Like a lot of industries that are just like kind of known for, like you said, Lauren, that like originally when this content was created, it was created by four men <laughs> and like mainly white men. So when women started finally being like, no, I like video games too. And I like comics too. I know what happens. I make them that men who were part of the industry for a long time started this. And then younger men who are currently in the industry also were like, yes, you're right, old white man. I agree. Let's get rid of all the women in our industry by doxing them and tweeting nasty things about them and seeing them just post a picture of them drinking a milkshake. And now we're going to hate them forever. Like silly, silly stuff. That was an editor, um, Heather Antos, that she just posted a picture of herself with like her friends drinking a milkshake. And then she got doxed by comic skate people because of that picture. Or yeah, because she's she she's a, she's a script writer, right? A comic script writer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure where she's working right yeah. now, but at the time she was working for Marvel, I think, when she posted. She was picture. like a pretty well known. Yeah, it she continues to be obviously. Yeah, mm -hmm. just to yeah. throw in a positive note, though, yeah. I will say like when I first started doing like comics conventions and like indie conventions back in like 2009. Um, all the time, like someone would come to my table and be like, wow, a girl. And, um, which was like annoying, but funny. And now yeah. like all of those conventions are like at least 50% women, if not more, like mm -hmm. it's, so it, it's changing. And, and I'm an alumni of CCS, the center for cartoon studies. And my class in 20, my graduating class 2011 had the most women, per class they had ever had at that point and there were seven of us and now all their classes are more than 50 percent women oh, that's great that's yeah great. yeah and that's in 10 years just heard um webtoon the uh it's a platform for web comics basically yeah. um and they actually have a majority of their artists are female and a majority of their readers are female and but like a big majority and they're a huge huge web comic platform so that's, that's, when I heard that, I was just like, oh my gosh, to the point where they're like, we actually need to make an effort to bring more men onto this platform. When I heard that, I'm like, oh my God, the tides are turning. Because <laughs> it's a big name. It's a really big company. So that's very exciting. <laughs> great. Yeah. And to continue the positivity, um, it's really great to see women from the suffrage movement who were not recognized in history getting more recognition, both like through the comic we just did. And otherwise, like I, I just found out a couple weeks ago about Ida B. Wells getting a posthumous Pulitzer for yeah. her writing her anti-lynching writing that she did around the end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s. So, I mean, there's a lot of catching up to do, but it appears that we are at least beginning to do that. And it's right there. Yeah, we gotta start somewhere, right? Gotta start somewhere. <laughs> Um, all right, so Ali, I'm just gonna throw a visitor question at you real quick. Um, did each artist choose their own topic for, for the book or were the topics assigned? Can you clarify that for us, please? Yeah, definitely. So when I first came up with the idea of putting this book together, I had some key either people or events that I knew I wanted covered in the book because I there was just like a general narrative thread that I wanted to make sure was covered. But then when I had the open call for submissions or when I was emailing people directly, I still asked them, like, do you have a personal thing that you would like to pull in or do you have a particular woman that you want covered or anything like that? So it was a little bit of both. Um, and some of the, the topics were like, well, I want Susan B. Anthony to be covered. She, I want to do a comic specifically about Susan B. Anthony. But then the two women who did that comic came up with this different angle that I didn't tell them what to do. I was just like, Susan B. Anthony, bio comic, go. 
and they developed this whole narrative of these two girls going to a museum and one is a big fan of Susan B. Anthony and one thinks she's a racist and this magical wizard woman appears to walk them through history and kind of teach them like, well, you're both right and here's why. And I didn't tell them to do that. That's just like the direction that they took it. So it was kind of a little bit of everything. And then there were some women who put, like submitted ideas of women that I didn't even know about. Um, like one of the comics was on an artist, Rose O'Neill, that I had heard her name before, but I didn't really, I didn't even know that she was the woman who illustrated the Cupid, like the Cupid doll, which I had heard of before, but I didn't know anything about her. She's this huge, amazingly empowered female illustrator who at one point was making more money than men back in the days of like Puck Magazine, which was like a long, long, long time ago. So yeah, a lot of people brought things to the table that I hadn't even considered and wouldn't have if it wasn't for them actually pitching it to me. That's awesome. Thank you for that. So I'm looking at the clock, 2.35. I'm seeing we are out of time for this. Um, so first and foremost, I want to thank you all for your amazing work with this book. It is incredible. Allie, what's your website again? So our website for the Micropress is littleredbird.press. That is the name of our Micropress right there. And it's just littleredbird.press. That's where you can find this book. And you could also find all of our social media handles if you want to keep following what we're doing. Yeah. Um, and um, for the sake of the fact that this video will live online on the park's social media, um, I'm just going to invite any future consumers of this video content. You are welcome to continue to leave comments. If you have questions for the artists, I am happy to forward your questions to them via email and we'll post back on the park's social media with, with whatever their responses are. Um, and so again, thank you all for participating in this program and best of luck to you in your comic careers. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for, so for organizing this. It was fantastic. Thank yes, thank you so much. Thanks, y'all. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.